10 libraries in Drupal 10 core. Uh, the top 10 is perhaps a bit misleading. What do we mean by that? We are talking about the ones that are the most useful to you building a project right now. Uh, when we are talking about libraries, I guess I'm getting ahead of myself. Who am I? Come on in. Come on. We've already hit the button, so now you're just in the middle of the recording, Christine. <laughs> Who am I? I'm Andy Bloom. I'm a senior front-end developer at Lullabot. Uh, I am a recent addition to the maintainers at TXT file as a subsystem maintainer for Olivero. If you are on the uh, Mastodon social platform, I'm uh, at Andy underscore Bloom at Drupal dot community. And you can find me at uh, Andy hyphen Bloom on Drupal.org, GitHub.com, LinkedIn.com, et cetera, et cetera. So when we talk about libraries, what are we talking about? We're talking about the libraries in core that are defined in the core.libraries.yaml file. Uh, any guesses how many libraries that file defines? 75. 75 is a really good guess. It is actually, uh, I was going to say 75. It may be one more or less than that, but it's very close. <clears throat> um, each library in that file is going to define one or more front-end assets to pass along to the client side. Uh, that's CSS or JavaScript files. They may or may not depend on other libraries. Um, core libraries, however, will only ever depend on other core libraries. Uh, but they're there in core. And if you're building in Drupal core, your theme or module can use them. You can depend on them, extend them, override pieces of them, all of that. Um, <laughs> this is what I get for starting a couple minutes early. So, a uh, couple of caveats. Avoid internal libraries and avoid deprecated libraries. Internal libraries are marked as internal, and there may be some major changes in minor version releases. So avoid them because they are internal for a reason. So, number one on the list. What is our first library that we want to talk about? If we're going to talk about core slash Drupal. It's still not 3 o'clock yet, so we are. But we got a lot to get through. So our first library is core slash Drupal, and you should probably already be using this. This is the uh, core Drupal JavaScript API piece. What's it do? Well, when you add this dependency to your project, uh, it's going to create a globally scoped Drupal object. And what that's going to allow you to do is uh, all core and contrib JavaScript objects can live under a single namespace to avoid collisions with anything not coming from Drupal. And it also sets up the Drupal behaviors functionality, uh, which let us attach fun functionality on page load or when you have Ajax or big pipe stuff come rendering in. And we can also detach that functionality uh, before content is pruned, moved, or serialized in some way. Um, curious if anyone here has ever written a behavior with a detach. I think it's not super common, but you can do it. So this is what your JavaScript will look like. Uh, you're going to create your Drupal uh, JavaScript bit in uh, an immediately invoked function expression. That's the first and last lines here, wrapping everything under a single JavaScript scope. And then you create your new behavior. In this case, my underscore behavior. You can then create an attach key on that object and a detach key, which will both be functions. And then. Uh, under the hood, Drupal will call Drupal.attach behaviors, and it will run through all the behaviors that were defined and all of their attached methods, uh, or detach behaviors, and it will run through and run all the detached methods that may have been defined. You can run these same methods in your JavaScript uh, if you had a need to. If you were to do, for example, a, some kind of asynchronous JavaScript, writing a fetch function that's going to bring stuff in, and you feel like you might need behaviors to run on that, you can do that fetch, and then after that promise completes, you can run attach or detach behaviors uh, as is needed. Or if you want to, because it's just JavaScript and it's all on the client side, you can go to the individual behavior that you may want to run after yours and run its attach method. So let's take a quick look at this. What's this look like? Uh, I've created a demo for each of these libraries in CodePen. It is 100% removed from Drupal. To give you an idea of how this is set up, uh, it's all in the HTML file here. Uh, if you want to come look at this, and this is why I provided the link, uh, the script files are here, and they're titled with the exact file as it is in the uh, Drupal repository. So this core Drupal dependency here is going to bring in Drupal.js and Drupal.init.js. And then the way your JavaScript might be able to use it is written in the JavaScript pane here. You can ignore this. Uh, console.clear, it's just a way to keep everything clear between changes. But as you can see, uh, when I refresh this page, immediately in the console, we're getting 
attach behavior one, attach behavior two, attach behavior three. We've defined three behaviors, one, two, and three, and they all have an attach method. And if I come in here, I can run Drupal dot attach behaviors, and they all run again. Or I can run Drupal dot behaviors dot behavior one dot attach, and only that one runs. You can do the same thing with the detach methods as well. So this is the way that you should be wrapping JavaScript up in um, your Drupal themes and methods, hopefully. <clears throat> Moving along. Number two is Drupal settings. Um, this one comes along kind of for free if you use core Drupal, because core Drupal depends on this one. But it's good to know how it works on its own. Uh, Drupal settings is a great way to bring information from your Drupal backend into your Drupal front end. What it's going to do is it's going to create a second globally scoped object, Drupal settings. Note the capitalization is lowercase d, capital S, um, whereas our globally scoped Drupal object was just capital D. On page load, what this is going to do is look for a very specifically crafted script tag. It's looking for data Drupal selector, Drupal settings, JSON. And inside that is a JSON object stringified out. It parses that and stores that JSON object under uh, Drupal settings. So in your uh, project, what you can do is attach stuff. So we have form attached Drupal settings where you might have libraries instead. You could go to Drupal settings. <laughs> and it broke the recording too. Oh, oh OK, don't touch it. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. OK, all right, all right. I did that to me at Ned Camp, and then the recording was all off. So all right, so the my setting and then my value. And then what you can see is in the DOM, we get our script tag with that big data Drupal selector. It's stringified JSON. And then if you go to console log and you log out Drupal settings, my setting, it will return to you my value. This one also has a demo. And what we can see here, we have this big script piece. This particular bit of JSON, I just pulled off of Mike Herschel's Olivero 10 demo site. Um, and so this is what would load up on the page. There is no JavaScript needed for this particular one. If we just open the console and go to Drupal settings, we get that same Drupal object. On page load, it just finds that object and parses its contents into JSON. If you want to, you can also go deeper into that and just say, hey, just show me the path object, and we'll just see the path part of it. Up next, normalize. Uh, if I say normalize, where are my front-end developers and know exactly what this is? <laughs> Cool, okay, so normalize, uh, it's a very lightweight library. Its only thing is to add a normalize.css file. It's used in Claro, Umami, Stable9, and the starter kit theme. And its job is to make browsers render all of the elements exactly the same, uh, adjusting for how Firefox might add extra padding versus Chrome versus Safari, um, et cetera. This would be a great one to add as a theme's uh, global dependency. I would avoid putting it in modules unless you have a very specific need to impact global styles. How you would add this one, uh, just like everything else, you have your global library, you define your version, your CSS, your JavaScript, and then dependencies, throw core slash normalize into it. And that's all. All it's going to do is bring in uh, a new CSS base level CSS file, normalize.css. There is a demo. I'm going to skip it because it's not that really important. If you'd like to look at it, feel free to look at the slides and click the demo link. After that, we have debounce. Uh, anybody here familiar with debounce? We're getting to the ones where people start to drop off. Cool. So debounce. Some events in the browser happen uh, exceedingly rapidly. If you scroll, scroll events just fire off left and right all the time. If you don't do anything on it, don't worry about it. The browser just says, here's an event, and nobody attaches to it, and it just goes away, and it's not a problem. But if you start attaching JavaScript responsive functions to scrolling events, resize events, stuff like that, uh, you can very quickly find yourself in um, uh, blocking territory and blocking performance and all that kind of stuff. Drupal debounce is a function that returns a function that then only runs once per a set time period. So as an example, we can select, uh, there's two targets here I've selected, one to do debouncing before and one to do debouncing after. So we're just selecting our two targets, one and two. We can create our handler function with whatever functionality it may need to do. And then we create a handler that fires at the start by running debounce with the handler function over 250 milliseconds 
true, it fires at the start, uh, and this, this parameter is called fires immediately, or immediately, or something along that line. Or we can make it fire at the end. We run the same function, we have the same wait period, but we only fire it after events are done. So what does this look like? Let's look at the demo, and hopefully this makes a little more sense. If we have some scrolling windows here, this one is not debounced. Watch this scroll down zero pixels. As I scroll, that number is going to update all the time. Now, this is not a particularly heavy piece of JavaScript that makes that update. But if you're going to start doing stuff like moving around layouts when things happen or firing off fetch events, you don't want to fire off, oh, we just sent off 250 of those, right? We want to make sure that we're debouncing. So we can wait for the events to stop happening and then fire. So I can scroll a whole bunch and that zero pixels stay as zero pixels until I've stopped scrolling for at least 250 milliseconds. And then it will update. Or I can tell it to fire immediately and then it's gonna wait for a break before it fires again. So we get one right at the start. And as long as I don't stop, it won't fire again. Now if I stop, the next time I start scrolling, it fires again. So that's debouncing. Next up is announce. We're gonna make client-side updates uh, accessible for screen reader users. This is gonna provide a simple to use function that creates and updates an ARIA Live region. Anybody here familiar with ARIA Live? I guess a better question, who's not familiar with ARIA Live? Okay, so ARIA Live regions work by when you put text into them, if you have a screen reader going, it immediately is going to read that or it'll wait until it's done reading what it's currently reading to announce that out to you. So you can just call Drupal.announce, and whatever text is in there, it will put into Drupal's ARIA Live region. It does accept a second parameter uh, of polite or assertive. Polite is the default, and we always like to be polite, unless it's important, in case, which case suddenly, you know, the room is on fire and you need to be assertive, right? But generally, we want to wait until the screen reader is done reading what it's currently reading before we interrupt it uh, and make it read something new. So. This one is a little hard to demo. You're just gonna have to trust me that it works because I'm not turning on my screen reader. Down here, I have unhidden our ARIA Live region. And if I put in, this is my announcement. Spell it right, cement. And I announce my text. It'll put it down there in the ARIA Live region. If this is an urgent time sensitive announcement, this is my urgent announcement. We announce the text, it replaces the text, and it's urgent. If you make uh, an ARIA Live region assertive, it does generally interrupt mid sentence, and it may not go back to rereading. So we try to prefer polite announcements to assertive ones. This would be a great way to do uh, if you have any kind of JavaScript that's going out, fetching something, bringing something back, and updating the contents of the page. A screen reader user may have gone past that, and now they don't know that this has changed. Or if they're interacting with some kind of form that's gonna bring in additional information, you wanna make sure people who can't see that visual update know that it happened. Next, displace. Anybody familiar with displace? No hands in the room, all right. Displace is a great one. You have all used it, I promise. Uh, Drupal Displace is there to create, store, and retrieve offset values. If you've used the admin toolbar and it's got that nice position fixed up there, it adds some padding to the body to push everything down so nothing gets hidden underneath it. It is displacing the page content. This is just helping prevent hiding content under fixed position elements docked to the edge of the viewport. The admin toolbar is one. Um, the layout builder's off canvas dialog is one. It displaces to the right side. Uh, and in Drupal 10, we have added some CSS variables where you can use that in your layouts if you want to. The way this one works, you can retrieve uh, an offset by just calling drupal.displace.offset.top. And uh, it's written very cleverly, so that's actually a getter method, and it will just return the value to you. And it's also a setter method, so if you set it as drupal.displace.offsets.left equals 100, it will store that value and update everything it needs to. And then in your CSS, you can call that variable. Uh, and I would generally say always use a fallback, like the zero pixels here, so that you actually have a value there in case that variable isn't set. Wow, we are flying. I apologize. <laughs> have I lost anyone entirely? Great, we can come back at question time. So, a demo of Drupal displays. 
So here we have, let's refresh that. So we have the top of our page here. We have some space between the admin toolbar, but if we close this, you'll notice that it's moving back and forth. All that we're doing is on our button click, we are running our one of our functions that we wrote, where to put, there it is, collapsed. Account for fixed header, we're just saying drupal.displace.offsets.top. Let's get the bounding client rectangle, the height from our header, and we'll update that. So as we change that, every time we click it, it shows something new, it updates the bounding client rect height property, and we update our, uh, our displace values. And so we can update it back and forth. And as we scroll, stuff goes underneath it. Number seven, we have the Drupal message uh, uh, library. Drupal message is uh, the one here that's gonna work a little bit differently. It's a little bit more object-oriented JavaScript. It's gonna create a JavaScript class that can be used to insert messages into the DOM that match your current theme. So it's gonna go in and hopefully if you've created the theme well, you've used the, uh, the theming methods that exist on that. If you don't know what I'm talking about, sorry. Um, messages can be added to the messages block, the default space where all of your messages go, or you can also add them somewhere else. So if you've got some interactive part of your page and you wanna pop up an alert right here where it's relevant, you can do that. Um, and then you can use that class to add or remove or clear all messages, and your messages can be typed as status or warning or error messages. So we wanna create a messenger first and use new uh, Drupal message. that's our constructor. Uh, we can, when we create a new message, dot add the message text and pass in the type of error. That will return an ID that we can store if we want to. Um, you don't have to, you don't have to hold on to it. It doesn't matter too much. Um, but you can remove if you have the particular ID of the message you wanna remove, or you can clear all the messages that have been created from this same messenger. If I made a new messenger and I wanted to clear all messages, I would have to call it on both of those different uh, messenger objects. So let's look at the demo of that one. We can put in our message text. This is my status message. It's a status. We'll put it in the default location, which everybody knows right at the top of the page. When we create that message, it pops up up there. I can make a warning one as well. This is my Warning message for an in, oops, warning message for an in, an in page app. And if we put it in a custom location, we can pop in that message right there where it would be relevant to the form that we're working in. So you can do either site wide at the top or you can put them in a page relevant location. Again, if you want to. If you want to see where this is all happening, you can go and look through the JavaScript on this. So we're creating our default messenger, drupal.message. We have a custom messenger. We are creating it with a specific uh, DOM element. So this is saying we're gonna create a messenger that's gonna exist down here. We have our button, which is gonna handle all of the clickiness of, of this form. Uh, and when we click that, we're gonna grab our message text value. We're gonna check the values of our status and our location get the correct status, the correct messenger, and then add our message into the place. Yes? Does this connect with announce or I need to implement announce? That's a great question. Uh, Drupal.message does pull an announce on its own. Um, and we can see that down here somewhere, if we get to Drupal.js and it is also using debounce, uh, so we can't put in a thousand messages all at once. So it's gonna pull in, it, uh, the message library does depend on debounce and announce. Uh, once, we have any fans of once? Yes, good. You should be using once, once is excellent. Uh, once is a function that you can use to select items, well, once. Um, you select that item once and then you never select it again. It will always return an array of items. Even if it doesn't select anything, it will return to you an empty array. 
but anything that it does select, it's going to process with the data once attribute and a specific ID relevant to the function you've ran, you've, you've run. Um, and items can be selected from a specific context. There are multiple ways to select. You can use a specific selector string like you would use in CSS. You can pass it reference to a node, a specific one, like with query selector. You can pass it a reference to a node list, which is what you get back from query selector all, or you can pass it reference to an array of nodes, which is what you're gonna get if you use jQuery. So here we have const all buttons is gonna equal document.querySelector all button. It's gonna scan the page for any element that's a button. We'll pass it into all buttons. Then we'll get our unprocessed buttons and we'll get that with once. This is the ID and then all buttons. So what this is gonna look at is it say, hey, all of those buttons we selected the first time, check them now and see if they have a data once value of my dash buttons. If they do, we're gonna filter those out and we won't act on them again. If they don't, we know we've not picked them before and now we can pick them once. <clears throat> you can also do links, once, my links, We'll select with a selector string of A. Make sure they don't have the once attribute, the data once attribute, my links, and we'll select them from document or from some specific div or whatever element you want to. So you can pass in a parent that you want to select inside of. It's been a while since I looked at this one, so let me see if I remember how this one works. Oh, yeah. The great way, reason to use once. If we create a message, and you can create this message, you can do it over and over again. The problem is, if you don't use once, and we open the console, and we run our behaviors again, if we run that again, every time we click create message, now we're getting two of them at a time. And if you have had three, four uh, Ajax runs, now when you click create message, you're suddenly creating you know, dozens of them at a time. Not ideal. So what we want to do is, oh, look, there's an attached behaviors button I added. So, boom, four at once when we wanted to create one. If we clear those messages, though, and we run it with just once, doesn't matter how many times we attach the behaviors, it will only ever give us one new one. This is happening on this button because we didn't select it once. We are selecting it every time the behavior runs. So. We wanna make sure that we are uh, uh, working smartly and only adding event listeners once when they only need to be added once. Next up, sortable. This one's not super common. Anybody use this one? Do we have any fans of table drag in the room? Are you actually fans of table drag or like, I wish it was better? Can you imagine it being better? Sortable is a third-party JS library for drag-and-drop lists. Uh, it has a huge variety of options and configurations, which I will show, because I know Christina is very excited about this one. This should hopefully uh, be able to replace table drag JS and make things better. Let's look at what sortable JS can do. With a simple list, you can just drag-and-drop things. And we don't have to maintain it, because it's a third-party library. You can get two lists that can share items between them. Ooh. <laughs> we can have lists that clone from one to the other. So item one is now in both lists. And we can move this item three over, and now it's in both lists. So there's lots of options that we can do with this. Uh, and it's something that should hopefully make front end things a little bit easier to maintain. Uh, if you want to see how this one works, we create ourselves a list. We give ourselves a way to grab it with a class of reorderable. We select that element, and then we just use sortable.create, the element we have a reference to. So in our demo, literally all you have to do is add this dependency, and that's in the HTML. And look at this, two lines of JavaScript. Look at this, look at these two beautiful, two beautiful lines of JavaScript, right? And so I have item one, and I say, oh, I want this one to actually go third in the list. And now you have item one third in the list. That's all, that's all it takes, it's just two lines of JavaScript. That's so easy. Now, what you do with it after that, that's gonna be more JavaScript, but um, making, making reorderable things isn't difficult because Core brought this in. Yes? I'm assuming it support keyboard uh, moving. Great question. Let's find out. 
because I don't actually know. Uh, how do I over to debug mode? The question for the recording is, does this support uh, keyboard navigation? Doesn't appear to, but it might just be because these are uh, list items and they're not selectable by keyboard navigation by default. So um, it might be possible if you do it some other way. Next up is tabable, and that is our 10th one, and we flew right through all of those. I anticipate questions. <clears throat> tabable uh, is great for finding items that are keyboard accessible. It provides to us four utility functions. They are tabable, focusable, is tabable, and is focusable. The ones that start with is give us a nice Boolean. You pass it a single uh, element, and it will tell you, can this receive focus from tabbing to it? And then is it focusable by default? So a tabable one could be any form element, any button, any link, or any item that has a tab index greater than zero. While is focusable is going to not include the tab index ones. Uh, there are some additional config options in that repo's readme. Tabable and focusable will get you a list of everything selected under a specific selector. <clears throat> um, this one I would recommend destructuring it because when you pull this in, it's going to make a globally available tabable uh, uh, thing, uh, what's the word, variable. And you can destructure that into tabable.tabable. So I would destructure it immediately to have access to the four that are in there. This first one, tabable document, is going to give us an array of all of the tabable elements in tab index order that are inside the document. If you pass it main, it'll do all the ones in main. If you pass it a specific article, it'll only do the ones in the article. So it can keep your, your scope relatively small. Focusable does the same thing, but instead of tabable elements, it's your focusable elements. And then for is tabable and is focusable, you can pick a specific element. Obviously, we all in this room know that anchors are both tabable and focusable. But if you're working with things that you may not know exactly what element's coming in, that could be handy to know, is this thing tabable or focusable? And so this is great for helping build up um, focus traps and whatnot. I think this is what they're using in core to keep focus trapped within the um, pop-up dialogs. So as a demo here, I've got a field set with some assorted DOM nodes, and we'll say get our tabable elements in our console, click that button, and it refreshes the page as expected. Here we go. So an array of all of our tabable elements. We have a button, we have a link, we have an input, we have the summary from the field set because it is a tabable element. Um, we have the details that are in, uh, 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 I'm sorry, the contents of a details element that doesn't have a summary. So, and if we go through and we actually tab these, we get our button, which has a super visible um, outline right now. We get our link as expected. We get our input as expected. We get the summary of a details element and we get the, we just get the other details element, but it, it is actually the contents there. And that is tabable. Woohoo! thank you. That was super fast. Um, if you have questions, if there's one that you feel we went through too quickly and would like to go back, now is your chance. Mark. The uh, detach, where, what is the use case for that? On the uh, number? Sure, yeah. Um, so the detach, it's a great question because um, I, I've never used it. I've literally never used it. Um, what I would say it's probably best for is if you want to um, use remove event listener. So if you are in attaching, adding an event listener, and then you click on something that's going to do AJAX, you could remove that event listener and add a new one with the new contents once they load in. That would be my best guess for when detach would be useful. Yeah, I actually just was working on a navigation, and I had one attach, and I put a bunch of like attach and detach functions within my like feature attach behavior, but now I feel like I'm getting some ideas how I can do it to maybe pull it out into, like, you know, there's a setup, attach behavior, and then a detach maybe at the end. But you could, because the other thing, right, is detach is going to be run, I think. It's, I think it's going to be run as AJAX is, come, is being called, and it could detach stuff. 
like the replace. To, right. So you're going to detach stuff in this context, bring in a new context, put it in, and then you'll run the, the attachments. But if you're not doing a bunch of stuff in the Ajax parts that are being swapped mm -hmm. in and out, um, your event listeners don't need cleaned up before the page unloads. It just gets thrown away with the entire DOM. That's so. true. Yeah. Other questions? Did you show a link to where the demo is? The, uh, the demos are all in the slides, and the QR code will get you the slides. Okay. This will be recorded. Actually, I have another question. Yes. Um, in the past, I've looked through like Ajax.js to mm -hmm. try to get ideas, and I know there's some documentation on Drupal.org, but what, what would you say is the best way to discover new core <laughs> JavaScript and how to use it? It, it? It is very well documented within the JS file. It is <laughs> documented pretty well in the JavaScript file. So if you're not familiar, I guess we could do this, right? We can just dgo.to slash r slash Drupal. And we can look right at the repository. Um, all of course JavaScript is in core. We can find in here the libraries.yaml file. And so if you know what library you're using and you want to see what it's doing, you know, for example, Ajax, Drupal.ajax is right here. Here's all of its dependencies. Here is the exact file it's doing. So we know it's in misc slash Ajax. So we can Go back to MISC and then Ajax. Generally, I would say the best way to learn about this would be unless a blog post has been written and you know a blog post has been written, read, read the code. It's not the prettiest or easiest to read, especially if you're new coming to some of this stuff, um, but it's there. Yes? Do you know if there's plans to move this to TypeScript? Like Is there plans to move this to TypeScript? I don't know of any, and I'm doubtful of plans of moving it to TypeScript because we just pulled out all of the build steps for JavaScript from ES6 to ES5. Um, with the move to Drupal 10, we don't have to support IE anymore. Hooray, hooray. Um, but when that happened, we didn't have to compile all of the ES6 down to something that IE could support. Since that all just came out and there's no more tooling around it, I would guess there's not plans to move it to TypeScript. I could be wrong. Anybody else? We've got 15 minutes. I mean, we can take lots of questions. <laughs> which, which is your favorite? My favorite. Uh, it's got to be probably once. It's so nice to not have to worry about, oh, I've just added that event listener 17 times. And now when I click my menu drop down button, the menu just whoop, 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 whoop. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to follow up with which one you hate. Absolutely loathe. They didn't make it into the list. Uh, well, uh, all, all the stuff you jQuery. The jQuery one. <laughs> <laughs> jQuery is great. It served a great purpose for a long time. Um, the problem with it now is that it's adding additional page weight, uh, and it's really hard to replace because jQuery has a really expansive API that people have been depending on for years. And so if we want to deprecate it and get rid of it, we need to mimic its its API shape um, and be able to account for all that. And then that puts the weight back on. That puts all the weight right back on, right. Yeah. So um, if you are a JavaScript developer and you want to contribute, uh, if you would like to work, there are JavaScript modernization issues. Um, I'm not on them because that's a lot of work. <laughs> I've, I've worked on some of them, and it's really hard. So, um, But if you like a challenge, take a swing at it. Anybody else? Awesome. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>